I could please have you just stand approximately where the tape is for now. Thank you. Kaiser, what you are going to do is you are going to walk straight toward me when I ask you to. You're going to walk straight toward me. What are you going to do? I'm going to walk straight toward you. Great. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, let's do it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We have illustrated one very basic principle in science. It is so basic that most of you have forgotten about it, but we need to remember so we can learn something about waves. Probably learned it like in fourth grade, maybe fifth, somewhere around there. What basic principle is that? Give us a hint. No. I just gave you a hint. We did a whole demo. Man. No, it doesn't have to do with what happened after the collision. It has to do with the fact that we actually collided. Rick? Matter cannot take up the same space at the same time. Objects that have mass cannot take the same space at the same time. It's that basic. We did not pass through one another. We ran into one another. Thank you much. A wave. Is a wave matter? Does it have mass? No. So waves don't follow that principle. They can actually, actually occupy the same space at the same time. So waves behave very differently than Kaiser and I did. Right? Rather than bouncing off of one another, they're actually going to pass through one another. And what we're going to go through now is what happens when waves are occupying the same space. This basic principle is called the, uh, when they occupy the same space, we're going to figure out what happens via something called um, interference via superposition. Interference just means that they're going to interfere with one another when they occupy the same space. And superposition just means that you're going to add, basically add their amplitudes together when they interfere via superposition. So what we're going to do is we're going to illustrate interference via superposition. Sean is going to send down a wave pulse. I'm also going to send down a wave pulse on the same side of the spring at the same time. So I'm going to say 3, 2, 1, pulse, and you're going to do exactly what you just did. Got it? Okay. So what you're going to look for is what happens when these two waves occupy the same space. 3, 2, 1, pulse. Great. 3, 2, 1, pulse. Again, what you're looking for is the interference. What happens when the two occupy the same space? Um, Aileen, you were right there. What happened to the two waves when they were uh, occupied the same space? They kind of pass through each other. Yeah, but when they're right in the same space, I agree. It's definitely important to realize that they pass through one another, and after they occupy the same space, then it actually is if they never ran into one another to begin with. But more importantly, I want to know what happens when they're right in the same space. Sean, one more time. Three, two, one, pulse. What happens to the amplitude of the wave? Is it double? It, it's increased. The, the two are added together. Whether it's doubled has to do with whether they're exactly the same. But it certainly is increased. The two amplitudes are added together. So watch again. This is called constructive interference. Three, two, one, pulse. Do it again. Three, two, one, pulse. And you can see when the two are in the same location, those two waves add together, the amplitudes add, and it's called constructive interference. I'm going to switch to the other side. Sean, you're going to keep doing what you just did. And this is instead going to be destructive interference. So we have one, if you think of mine as above the, um, above the uh, spring here as positive energy, this is going to be below, which is negative energy. When they interfere with one another, they're actually going to cancel one another out. It's called destructive interference. Three, two, one, pulse. Again, destructive interference. This one's always a little bit difficult to see. Three, two, one, pulse. <laughs> Three, two, one, pulse. Okay, so Herman, you were right there. When these two occupy the same space, what happens? It happens very quickly and it's difficult to see, but what did you um, see? The amplitude decreases. The amplitude, they kind of cancel one another out and they decrease. If they had the same amplitude, one positive, one negative, we would get something called total destructive interference and would actually be completely flat, the concept of total destructive interference. One other little thing I want to talk about is reflection. When this runs into Sean over there, we actually get reflection with inversion. So it's reflected in that it bounces back, but it is also inverted in that it switches sides. So you can see this is reflection with inversion. 
And in order to have reflection with inversion, you need something called a fixed end, as in Sean is not allowing his hands to move, so therefore we have reflection with inversion. You could also have something called reflection without inversion. In order for that to occur, Sean would actually need to allow his hands to move without friction, which is actually very difficult to do, so I can't really show a demonstration of that. We have reflection with inversion, requires a fixed end, in other words, the end does not go up or down. And you can also have reflection without inversion. which requires a free end. Now, by a free end, that means that the end is free to move up or down without any friction. So what we just went through is, the first one was called constructive interference. And the other one was called destructive interference. And if they completely cancel one another out, it's called total destructive interference. Uh, let's see. So on your in your text on page 460, 460, I'm going to walk through some of the figures on page 460. On page 460, you see two waves that are going toward one another in figure A. In figure B, they are almost occupying the same space. And in figure C, you can see that they are now occupying the same space. These slightly grayed out ropes are the original amplitudes. If you go back and compare, those are the original amplitudes. In this one, we have this is the constructive interference. You can see that these two amplitudes have added, and we have constructive interference for these ropes. Now, one thing you need to make sure you understand is after they interfere constructively with one another, they pass through one another, and it's as though they had never run into one another in the first place. Because it's just that they occupy the same space and then pass through. So if you go all the way back to A, those original amplitudes are going to be the same as the amplitudes that they have at the end. Again, constructive interference. Uh, last year, I took the opportunity to, to attempt to videotape this because it's hard to see it when it's, when it's happening on the floor. So what you're going to see here is um, an attempt to show this. And it's a little bit dark. It's hard to get the contrast between the spring and the floor, but you can see it happening here as the springs come through. Uh, go back. So you can see originally right here they have a specific amplitude. You have the two waves. And then when they interfere with one another, you get the constructive interference right there. And then they pass through one another. And afterwards, you can see the final amplitudes are the same as what they were at the very beginning. So that is constructive interference. We can also talk about, going back to the pictures in your book, these on 461 have to do with destructive interference. So you have different amplitudes, one positive, one negative. When they occupy the same space, you can see that they are going to cancel out. Now this is not total destructive interference, but rather just destructive interference. What would the rope look like if this were total destructive interference? In other words, if both amplitudes had the same magnitude, one was positive, one was negative. Ashray. It would just be like a straight rope. It would be a completely straight rope. So for this brief moment where they occupy the same space, that rope would actually just be straight. And then those two waves would continue on as though, again, as though they had not interfered with one another. Again, I did my best to try to videotape this. So you can see here in this destructive interference video, we have the two waves coming toward one another. They're about to interfere with one another. You can see one positive, one negative. And then right when they interfere with one another, right about uh, they're starting to, so you can see right here they're interfering with one another. We go from there to here, and right around here is where we have to, or close to total destructive interference, and then the waves again pass through one another. Now, there is a, um, 
a commercially applicable use to destructive interference. Pretty much straight up, this is destructive interference. What is that application? I own one of these products, and probably several of you do as well. It's a specific type, Riku. What are they called, Darn? But specific, there's a specific type of headphones. Sandra? Noise canceling headphones. What noise canceling headphones do is they have a microphone on the outside of the headphones. Those, that microphone records what it hears. And this works best for ambient noise, like the sound of a tractor or an engine or something like that. And it records that ambient noise. There's a little processor in the headphones that then take that, that sound wave and they flip it over the x-axis. They actually phase shift it by 180 degrees. And what you get is they then broadcast that signal inside the headphones and you then get destructive interference of the ambient sound, the sound outside the headphones, which is what you don't want to hear. So you're actually using destructive interference of those sound waves to hear the sound that you were trying to hear better. 